Hello and welcome to the fourth episode of the first season of the Code & Culture podcast. Today I will explore the strategic role of HR with Perry Teams, author, founder and chief energy officer of PTHR, ranked the most influential HR thinker by the HR magazine in 2023. We'll talk about his professional journey, lessons learned along the way and coming HR trends. My name is Luca, I'm founder of organizational diagnostics company Quantify and I will be your host. Okay. Good. I think we are ready. So tell me a bit about your childhood. I know I sound a bit like Freud, but I'm wondering, were you always interested in people? Was this what drove you to HR or was there something else? When I was a lot younger, I was very interested in the animal kingdom and, and wildlife. Um, and I thought my um, f- future kind of job would be in some kind of veterinary role. But uh, I guess as you get a little bit older, you realize just how difficult the study path is to that. And I was from a very working class family. So people worked in factories and that kind of thing. So I didn't really think that was the kind of career for me. But I did some work experience, which is a thing we do uh, at a higher sort of level of education where you go and spend two weeks working in a company and it was in a building society and it was administration and I thought hmm, I quite like this and I studied I guess business kind of areas and thought yep that's what I want to go into and so I looked at clerical roles and I was interested in things like the law and journalism that kind of thing and um, a role came up in the civil service and I applied for that and got that So I joined the court service, so it was the Civil Administration of Justice. And I quite quickly found that the civil service was actually a really good employer for helping you develop. Um, It had a very strong training leaning. Um, And before I knew it, I was in managerial roles. And then I was running projects, so I had to learn how to do projects. And lots of those projects were in the 1990s, when a lot of the world was just starting to step into fully computerized record keeping and, and interactions. So I was involved in tech projects, and I suddenly came alive in that environment and really enjoyed it. So I was involved in specification, in testing, and then in training people on the new system because I'd used it, I'd tested it, so I knew what it did, and I knew the difference between um, manual administration and technology supported administration and I thought hey this this learning stuff's pretty cool so um, I I spent quite a while in that environment and then moved into learning and development in 2003 so I think that's where I then realized because I'd been in the workplace that there was a thing called personnel there was a thing called HR and that it had within it this learning function and so I jumped into that um, and and kind of learned by doing Um, And by working with experienced people, and before I knew it, I was like, wow, I tell you what I'm really interested in is the systems of work. And so HR and organization design, development, that kind of thing changed. There was a lot of that going on. I thought, well, this is familiar territory to me because I've been involved in this before. So I kind of moved into that area. But round about the, I suppose you'd say, early 2000s, I discovered alternatives to traditional hierarchical ways of working. So that has been my leaning ever since so when I look back to my childhood it's like that was nothing like I thought I was going to be in but it was an interest that sparked through the nature of what work provided for me as opportunities Um, so I don't look back and think I should have been a vet I look back and think I just didn't know this existed and so now I found it it feels very much like home for me for sure but how long have you been in the HR industry 21 years now. So like I say, I started in learning and development and I quite quickly realized that that was part of a bigger schema of things to do with how organizations are structured and decisions are made and the flow of work and so on. So it was it was the discovery of organization design and development that really, really got me because I could connect all of those past experiences about change, the introduction of technology, behaviors, and I became interested in things like psychology. So I look back now and think, I wish I knew about psychology when I was like 15 or 16, because I would have taken that path. Uh, Maybe um, organisational or occupational psychology might have been my thing, but I just didn't know about it at the time. So I guess we're always needing to be tuned into things that are presented to us, because if they talk to us and they call us, that's there for a reason. And so most of your, let's say, training came as training on the job. You just look for resources when you felt like you need them. Were there any mentors that you remember? Very much so. 
Yeah, very much so. I mean, uh, you know, my very first line manager was more a mentoring kind of individual than he was a kind of order delivering kind of body. So he knew that there were things about my sort of immaturity, I suppose you'd say, that he needed to help me with. But all along the line, I've worked with more experienced colleagues and, and benefited from them. And I think there's something about recognising people do like to give. There's something very generous in us in the spirit of almost like, well, I'll share that knowledge with you because then we're working together so we can be more useful to each other. But it, there's always something about what you want to give back. And I think there's something about the fact that you then either pass it on so you become a mentor um, or you make sure that there are things perhaps you can do that almost like pay back a little bit of that mentoring, whether it's diligence and commitment and so on. But I think there's something really appreciative about mentoring, I think is a powerful force still in the world of work, maybe even more so now when we're so time crunched, people with you in a sort of joint learning um, uh, adventure, I suppose, um, that's absolutely critical. Was there any, let's say, statement or a resource that uh, any of the mentors recommended, again, that stuck with you and or perhaps a book that changed your life? Mm, very good question. Um, I would say that kind of came a little bit later in my sort of development. So I was probably by then in a sort of managerial position. But I did work with some technologists who were very adept at both understanding technology from a coding and engineering point of view, but also its place in the world of work. And they introduced me to the concept of Scrum and Agile very early in my sort of adventures, I suppose you'd say, of looking at systems. Uh, and it really captured my attention. I mean, this is what, 2005? that kind of thing so the agile manifesto was only about four years old scrum masters weren't that prevalent everybody was doing waterfall projects still and this agile thing came along and i found a book the breathtakingly simple guide to scrum i think it was called i think just completely captivated me it's like wow so you can take away all these rules all these bureaucratic steps and you can allow people to explore and take um, accountability for what they're doing it just talked to me as a, almost like this is what I've been looking for in work because I kind of hated being controlled that really that really didn't appeal to me I liked having support when I needed it and it felt like this was the perfect manifestation of that so I think that uh, almost accidental bit of mentoring absolutely set me on a path and do you feel that uh, you know the feeling that you mentioned for yourself like I wanted mm. to have support when I needed but at the same mm. time I didn't feel like I want to be restrained or controlled mm. Do you think mm. it's common for everybody or is it specific to, let's say, more creative minded individuals? I don't know, you know, because uh, I guess my experiences in the world of work have sort of led me to think that there is a natural predisposition for some people to respond more positively to that kind of tempo and breadth and so on and others need much more compact linear predictable pathways so i think there's genuinely something about knowing you um, that may come from that sort of experience right where you're like why, why do i feel so incompetent here is it a lack of ability it might not be it might just be it's not your preference that's not for me i think you go into the realm of how important is it that i get this or do i find something that is more me because i don't think it's as simple as just giving up i think it's showing your adaptation and your commitment in a different way or using that to explore what next you should go for because that's clearly not in tune with you but don't just give up you know give it a go learn about yourself realize because there's no sense in doing something that's really demoralizing for you. Um, but giving up too soon means you never learn. Is there anything that you wish that you have learned a lot sooner? Oh, psychology, for sure, like a million percent. I mean, there's something about understanding how we behave, the decisions we make, the natural occurrences within us that we don't have the words for or the answers to. So I'd love to know that sooner because I think I could have been more comforting to myself. Um, I could have been more helpful to others around me in terms of how to be with me, but also how I can be with them. So I think that's one massive 
important thing, the sort of science of people and behaviours. I think that's terrific. Um, I think the other thing I really wish I had known about was more about the economic systems of the world because they're baffling, they're really confusing. How we create value in a monetary sense isn't just through good endeavours or a quality product, it's knowing how to use money to make money, which seems really perverse. But knowing that's useful because there's a complexity to it that you can understand and find your way to do what's economically viable for you if you know that's the game you're in. A lot of people don't even know the rules of that game. So I'd like to have known that too. Yeah. You also wrote a very influential book on how human resources can create value and impact business mm. trends. And this is the like the main theme that we are exploring in the first season mm. of Important Culture mm. Podcast, which is why I really, really wanted to talk to you. But mm. before we talk about the book itself, mm. what was the motivation behind writing the book? It's mm. usually quite an unpleasant endeavor when that we have to do it, right? So why did you go through the struggle of writing a book? Thank you, Luca. Yeah, um, it is hard work uh, to write a book, not just because it's it's hard on the brain, but it's hard on the spirit because you feel like you're putting yourself out to the world for them to be either critical or inspired about. And you obviously worry about the critical side of things and you hope there's an inspiration. Um, the actual book uh, wasn't what I intended to write. Uh, so I had a number of experiences in the mid 2010s an independent practitioner stepping out in the corporate world where I thought, wow, you know, there's so much work out there, but so few people would describe it as a as an act of love. And I thought, I want to find people who really love what they do and see if I can bring that kind of almost framework to the world so people can go, ah, so I need to know that this is the kind of place where that's likely to happen for me. So I went and interviewed some very pioneering companies where people do describe what they do as, as a loving act. And that's not just in healthcare, it was in technology, it was in all sorts of areas. And so I came back with that and thought, mm, maybe I'll write that book. But a publisher then got in touch with me and said, hey, we've got this title, Transformation HR. Would you like to write that book? And I thought, mm, yeah, I would. So what do I do? I thought, I know what I can do. I can use the transformational HR calling to say, do more of the work that builds these companies that people love. <laughs> so it almost became a thing. So it's like, wow, did the universe know <laughs> that that was the intention? Um, so I suppose I kind of upcycled my own hobby, uh, if you want to call it that, my own passion play into that book. Um, and then, of course, I set about thinking, well, I've got these stories. How do I set the um, agenda from HR now to HR delivering that kind of experience for people. That was literally my kind of start and, and, and finish kind of proposition for the book. So it gave me the chance to be really deliberate about how to paint that picture. And I think in the majority of cases, people who've read it would recognise that's what I've done. I've taken the knowledge of HR that I'd built up for almost 20 years at that point and fused it with the knowledge I'd created about alternative systems of work and alternative design and alternative experiences and brought the two together to say, hey, HR, you could do this. You could create the experience where people would testify to it being something that is an act of love, it's beneficial, it's got longevity, it's got adaptability and influence, whereas now people wouldn't say that. So that was my urge really, to give HR the chance to reinvent itself and transform itself into that. But the subtitle, the subtitle itself says that uh, this is how you create value. And it's yeah. not clear to me, and I think it's uh, mm. often like, Every CEO would be like, yeah, it, it all sounds like you're going to create a great business mm. environment for people mm. to enjoy, but I'll have to pay them. And for me to pay them, I have to sell the product. We have to be yeah. efficient. So how yeah. does it tie in with efficiency? Yeah, I think what it does actually, Luca, is it says to not overly mechanize and therefore obsess over the efficiency in that sort of linearity, predictability sense, because I think there are so many books written out there that have the answer to creating lots of profit. And it, and it doesn't necessarily work. It does in some cases, but not all, because the big variable is people. The big variable is how do you engender the spirit that people want to run through walls, do their best, look after themselves and you. So the stories in the book are deliberately a way of saying, 
Some of it means you have to remove things that you think are the efficient business practices. And that may be a big leap of faith for you. But these companies have proven that when you do that, it's more sustainable, collective and almost like a, a quantum force. Right. So I would say to people, if they're looking for an engineering solution, that won't be the book. But if you're looking for a more spiritual way to set yourself up to succeed and therefore be that more sustainably value creating organization, it will give you a lot of the um, ways that you can do that. And that's mainly um, about enabling people to discover where they're at the best and, and not just um, default, I suppose, to the really traditional practices of career paths, verticals, that kind of thing. So, yeah, so I've gone along a little bit of a controversial route, but I, I think I've given them evidence within it of companies who really, really do do that. How do you go from, uh, let's say, a traditional company to implementing these alternative approaches? What's the mm. right way and what's the wrong way to do it? Mm. I think the wrong way is to think that you have to do it rapidly and all at once. I think the right way is to do it with a sustainable tempo that delivers value at every point in its reinvention or transformation. So if it's that you have, um, uh, let's just say, inadequate management, you can compensate that by training lots of managers, but we've been doing that for decades. So what you say is, what, what, what do we need from a manager now? And, and recalibrate their role and help people understand what you mean by that. Some technical managers, great, specialists, whatever. Some, almost what I call enterprise managers, people who can have a more business-oriented, people kind of connected way of running teams, leading teams and getting them to do their best. That could be a way that you go, that's the first step in us being very different. And therefore that then gives me a chance to kind of ripple that out, to change a number of other things, which could be the way that you measure, monitor and allocate work. It could be the way that you deploy technology and allow more high touch human stuff. So I think it's a knock on effect, but knowing where to start, which is probably the most um, impairing part of what you are all about now. And by that, I mean, it limits your success, it inhibits change. That's probably the best place to start. So that's perhaps the, the right way to do it. Incrementally, with a good tempo, not always linear, sometimes parallel streams that can come together. But I think be very deliberate about it, be very inclusive about it, and make sure that you're doing it in an experimental way that reveals evidence that shows your faith has been rewarded by the result. And if not, what you learn and how you pivot. So I think that's the kind of recipe. But the wrong way is to over accelerate it and do it all at once. Well, OK, you said something really interesting here because, you know, you talk about it being a spiritual journey of sorts. But then on the other hand, you said use experiment, which is inherently scientific. It's the basic. <laughs> method so let's dive in this a little bit more. yeah let's say you take on the role of um, an hr person in a large organization how do you help set up an experiment like this do you go by one department how do you find or um mm. how do you find, find ambassadors how do you mm. put them into your ideas into great your question great question very practical so i think some of it depends on the scale and complexity of your business for a start because there may be some organizations that are so complex you need to keep the experiments very tight and very small and sort of aggregate them because of the complexity if you're a fairly simple business and the product and the service is quite stabilized and so on you could get a bigger experiment going and that could be just on something like how do we deal with inbound and allocate it to the right people or whatever it might be how do we deal with supply chain that kind of thing so that's my first port of call is understand both your scale and your complexity because that will help you know whether you go in what i would call a, a high entropic state lots of small things or a low entropic state slightly bigger more aggregated i think the next thing is to be very clear about the outcome you're looking for which is almost like where the science comes in you can hypothesize this and i think you say because of this we intend to we will know by therefore we are and then you kind of commit to it and i know some of the tech development runs very nicely on hypotheses to test so i think that's where the experiment gets a really smart frame around it which might seem opposite to a change program where you have a destination and you trickle it through it's like 
you've got a destination with your outcome, but your hypothesis will test a little bit more about how you get there and what you need to build as components to, to test that more rigorously. I think the next bit is a bit more spiritual because you don't just invite the experts. You say, who feels the inclination to want to make this change, whether you're in that vertical area or not? Because I think what you get is intent, uh, potentially a good momentum because people really want to be there. But I think you also get diversity of viewpoints. I think we try and change a lot of things with people where it's very difficult to get out of their own heads. They're preconditioned. They've got lots of experience. They tend to default to what they did before, maybe with plus five percent um, uh, adaptation or innovation. What about somebody who's completely untouched by your world, who will ask radical, what seem like even stupid questions that make it you go, wow, yeah, why don't we? try that so i like the thought that you get people to come with intent which is where the spirit bit comes in almost like we've got an adventure you may not have been on one before but we'd like you to come because you'll learn we'll learn and and there's that sort of soulful commitment to it um and of course you can bring in experts because a, a person may go i don't know the technicalities of this well let's bring an expert in at that point to help us with a knowledge gap and then let's see where we can go with it so that's where i think we have to have responsiveness to it um, but I think those people will commit and I think there's something about they shouldn't mark their own homework. So you need somebody who can perhaps independently come and verify the impact and the result and the evidence to then go, this has helped us know this now. Let's go this way and perhaps replicate. And then you need perhaps a systematic way to do that replication so that people know there's a kind of new thing to do, how it me means they go from and to that. And that's when you have lots of you know concurrent activities uh, that you can do at scale so so that's how i'd say that that can be sort of facilitated and enabled but i think the important point is the um the vision and the know-how of the what what it, are we trying to do here the hypothesis to test and then people who come in and go i want to do that i want to solve that problem i want to make that good i want to create a breakthrough thing and i think that intent is super powerful and why do you think this is in the domain of hr Right. Um, I guess because we have a couple of advantages. Uh, some of it is the psychology practice that I talked about. There are quite a lot of HR people very highly skilled in psychology who kind of know behaviours, know culture and the implications of that. So there's that technical ability there. I think the other thing we have as an advantage is that we, we, we are kind of wrapped around the whole organisation. You know, there are people everywhere. So we kind of have to know where people are and what the conditions are for them and, and kind of give them the kind of tools and the systems and the things that help them do their work. Um, and so I also think we we are a kind of natural aggregating point for a lot of these things. If it's all in tech and tech aggregate, then it's all about the tech, but it might not be. It might need the people bit. But if you've only got technologists in there, they might not know the people bit enough. And we have to know people and process and system and impact. <laughs> we have to know quite a lot. And I think we're like um, a, a very sort of thick, T across the top of a T shape, and then a, a kind of a people based um, vertical in that. And I think that thicker T across the top helps us. I think we also see that in people like business analysts, and I think we also see it in sometimes people who've got those relationships with the outside world, like your marketers. They have to know a lot about the product and the geographies and the buyers and the pathways. So often the best combinations are not just HR on the people side, it's the marketers with the messaging, it's the analysts with the data. And I think when you get those as a triangulation, that's pretty powerful stuff. That's another great topic. So as an HR person who really wants to create a lot of value and you know gain influence, not for power's sake, but for the sake of really improving the environment and the organization, mm. what kind of alliances should you be building? Who, who are you looking mm. at? recruit on your team to really help yeah. propel yeah yeah i think people who know design methodologies are very helpful and they might sit in product they might sit in technology people who know the design kind of cycle i suppose understand how you pitch design to solve a problem so you have to be very analytic about the problem you have to be very clear about the statement of the problem you then have to start thinking about what well, who's impacted and, and, and in what way so you have to then know the science and the empathy side of things for people um, so those people in design they're really really helpful because they then get you to a point of execution 
sometimes those people perhaps aren't quite so good on how you then replicate that into repeat practice and so on because that's where perhaps you might need a more operationally oriented brain so i think that's the combination i like to see somebody who can do great design and somebody who can do great replication rollout and, and and i guess you'd say sort of operational elements to it and i think those are two things that hr has perhaps not had the fullest span of experience on so i think they plug some really nice gaps and then within that i guess you've got analysts and scientists and and these are people who can talk to um you know literally the physics of things the biology of things um and and, and more and more we're kind of coding behaviors and, and understanding the brain so those people can add in quite a bit of that but i'd still start with the design and the and the replication of it because they're the two top and tail bits that really make a difference um the science bit can come in more nuanced and the analytics comes in more nuanced uh, when you're ready to start going how do we how do we um use evidence to base a decision on what the design proposal needs to be tested to in order to get the replication and rollout right so they're in the middle of that so yeah hr making friends with operational people and that could be technologists it could be you know um, uh, operations in the in the service sense uh, but the designers they're the crucial starting point for this in, indeed it's sounded to me like uh, you pretty much step by step through design thinking methodology right yeah that's very powerful that really does give us almost like uh, beyond the compass that gives us the map of how we navigate um so the steps in design thinking are uh, tested for good reason and they're you know used by people so well for good reason because that's how you go from um aspirational desire to very very well executed outcomes and products um and i just love the cyclical nature of them too that you do prototype test learn that cycles really good it's almost like how did it take us so long to conceive design thinking well we had earlier iterations of it with total quality management and kaizen and so on so there's a trail of things that leads to design thinking but i think that's the more modern human and mechanical combination that i think works really well so i do have a little moment of joy when i see hr teams talking about design thinking because i know they get it whether they're really good at it or not depends on the level of maturity and experience but they also know when to bring experts in yeah so how do you persuade people around you in other words you know how do you motivate them them on mm. with your plan yeah i think there's something that behavioral science is starting to give us as an indication of how sometimes people may not be aware of the need to make a decision in their favor so you give them the right kinds of stimulation in order for it still to be choice based but much more informed and much more in line with perhaps their cognitive abilities rather than perhaps their emotional abilities because i think sometimes we can rule out a good choice because we feel a little bit confused but actually if we're very clear up here that can override and go that's the logic that's what we've got to go for and then equally something might make sense but you don't feel it so then you have to kind of wrestle with which is the best on those so i do think there's something in how we present things to people that is not to manipulate them but just to give them a fairer chance of making the right choice that we know is in their interests on their terms though right so i think that's where you know i, I think it was near ial who wrote the book hooked and he unpacked gambling and he said look this is how we keep people doing addictive things he said so that's bad he said but we can use it for good because we know how people are kind of seduced by the way things are presented so why don't we use that to get them away from that and get them into more positive and and helpful things cognitive behavioral therapy you know all sorts of things have given us the chance to understand that the thinking process and the feeling process are often quite conflicting things and can override each other so we have to combat that when we're trying to get people into a better place for us and a sustainable business outcome let's say i've got a great example for you right there was a building society which is a mutual kind of bank in the uk who um wanted to offer a cheaper insurance product for its in, its its lenders um uh, and so it offered that uh, a counter kind of sale point but they didn't get much take up so they thought what's going on here it's a cheaper product why aren't we selling it so they went and spoke to people who were on the front line who said I know my customers really well. I don't want to inflict the sale on on them of something they don't need. And they're like, yeah, but we're cheaper 
than anybody they could probably get. And they're like, oh, are we? I didn't realise that. So <laughs> there was a kind of values conflict that they hadn't addressed in the way they wanted to market this product. And then, of course, sales went really high because people went, hey, Mrs. Smith, is your insurance due for renewal? Because whatever it is, we have a product that will make it more affordable for you. Here's the information. So that's a classic example where they didn't use the right techniques in both the sale to the customer, but also in the advocacy of the employee. Um, and if they knew that and they could address that, that wouldn't have happened. So, yeah, there's a good example where the outcome can be sometimes engineered. You mentioned cognitive behavioral therapy, and that's definitely a very potent tool. I recently spoke to, to an expert uh, in, in this field, and through the workshop, uh, you know, I, we kind of tested out a tool specifically to to encourage people to do something or to motivate or change. Yeah, and I think you're right to consult experts because I think it is the sort of thing that if we're amateur, that could be even more dangerous. But I think realising what it is and how it's been constructed over years of research and applied practice is important for us in that relationship between thought and feeling and action, right? And how sometimes we, we find ourselves even puzzled at our own actions going, that was actually self-harmful. Why did I do that? And to track it right back to the genesis of something that you perhaps hadn't given thought to helps you decouple from that and not keep repeating harmful instances and activities, which is very good for you. But you would not be able to do that unless somebody could hold that space very smartly with you in order for you to get there, because it could be quite traumatic if you don't. But applying it in a business sense is terrific, really, because you can imagine the business as a combination of those intellectual capabilities and the emotive sense of people's attachment to it to explain the actions. So I guess we think about some of the corporate corruption where people are complicit in it. And you go, why were they? It's like, but there was such loyalty they kind of knew it was wrong, but they thought it was justifiable. And therefore, the loyalty overrode the fraudulent practice or whatever it was. So it isn't as simple as people being willfully wrong. They are sometimes persuading themselves <laughs> through some past connection that this is justifiable. Yeah, really, really important that we know the psychodynamics of that. There is a lot of different factors uh, to, to analyse this question. Yeah. You know, in a business sense, it's a group of people that bands together to create value. It's a really simple and plain definition. Then on the other hand, you know, when mm. we look at it from, let's say, strategic HR point of view, we'll be talking a lot about values because you, you mentioned values here. Is loyalty above mm. uh, legality in our organization? Yeah. How did we come to this point? Yeah. And is this good or bad? Where does yeah. it lead us in the long run? So... In mm. some sense, you know, if people yeah. have values and organizations have values too, uh, is there a way to mm. represent an organization as its separate being? Because, you know, law in many ways recognizes mm. it as such. It's a separate entity from the people who are its constituents. Yeah. How do you naturally uh, look at this problem and how would you describe an organization? I, I guess I think about it in the sense of, um, like you said, a collection of humans that are there to create some value and think if you didn't have the formalities of a brand and a legal entity and so on, but people came together to do something, then you'd think about things like communities and you'd think about things like even groups and cells and, and so on, right? Because there's something about what brings those people together and that's the kind of mission type thing right it's like if we come together we can do this with more um, acceleration or power or whatever um, and, and I think obviously organizations are that uh, and what we do is we put intellectual properties around it like the brand like the rules uh, and obviously then the physical properties of materials and a place and so on right but when people say oh that organization is bad I'm like do you mean the organization or do you mean the people in it because I think there's normally something about the people in it who are the actors who are creating that sensation. So let's think of an example. Um, again, if we talk about some form of corporate corruption, then people go, PwC Australia is bad because it was recently fined for something. And you're like, hmm, I would say more that there are actors within that who did some bad things that gave that feeling to the world that the company was therefore bad 
But that company becomes a way that people can justify those acts. You're absolutely right. So therefore, I think I always look at an organisation as an organism. It becomes an organism. It's, yes, spiritual in some respects. It's, yes, physical in many respects. But it is still an organism because it's literally like all the parts kind of come together to make it a thing. I, I suppose a bit like a country. A country is a manifestation of all of the things that it exists to do uh, in serving citizens, using natural resources, whatever it might be. So, yeah, so I tend to think of them as organisms for that reason. And there's such an aliveness to it as well, which is, I think, important. It feels in, in ways when it's good that it has a very pure soul. Um, and that could be the intent, that could be the nature of its outcome. So, you know, you think about a humanitarian aid company and you would say, oh, yeah, its soul must be good because it exists to help people in terrible circumstances. But I know for a fact, because I've worked with people who've worked in those organisations, they'll say, but I had a really toxic experience. There were some dominant leaders who were bullying us. And, you know, my colleagues didn't have my back when I thought they would. And you're like... Surely people came together for the same reason, but there's something inside it that can sometimes pervert that sense of what it is. And so I think as an organism, you would say that, you know, like a tree might have a fungus and the fungus might sap the energy from the tree and eventually kill it. And you kind of think that shouldn't be the case, should it? Because they could have had a symbiotic relationship. So that's why I think organizations are organisms. It, it really resonates with me because, you know, we are in organizational diagnostics and one of the main tenants that makes what we do possible is to say, look, effectively, organization is an organism. It can get sick. There can be negative patterns yeah. that uh, create symptoms that drive people away and so on. But, it, you know, when people mm. come collectively together, they create sort of a common yeah. culture, common value system. And this value system may persist mm. in its own way. Mm. It has a system itself has its mm. own life, so to speak, and it draws the people yes. in. We can see yeah. it like as a mob mentality, or we can see it, uh, you mentioned, as, as yes. a lot of people who yeah. never defraud the system in their personal lives are perfectly yeah. willing to do it within yeah. an organization just because yeah. they, they align with its values. Yeah, I think that's a classic case where people are subject to a form of corruption. Um, and I think if we take the CBT example, there's something about the pattern that's been created in their mind where they will see perhaps other people doing things that are much more evil than they are, but they are doing a much more noble detachment from that when in fact they've got a little bit of, kind of Dunning-Kruger going on that they are persuading themselves that's noble when really it's just a slightly adapted version of the evil that they've seen in other people that's very difficult to trap and get out of your own head to to realize that because you convince yourself there's a lot of talk in psychology isn't there about your your sort of narrative the stories you tell yourself and sometimes you can tell them to yourself so powerfully that you absolutely believe them and don't take countenance of the damage that could come from that so again i think you're right to talk about it as a system there because i think what the system has done is that it has permeated into your psyche to the point you don't recognize it anymore and therefore when you look at whether the system could change you kind of think but it serves me i, I will continue with that just not quite as badly as they did perhaps <laughs> so you'll justify it um and it takes a very brave and very emotionally intelligent and aware soul to be able to step out of that and go i'm not being that which i guess is why we do see people who blow whistles and stand very strongly and then almost put themselves in a harmful position by making a really strong moralistic stance on things and they often do bring things down you know, they can collapse empires um, because people then kind of go, wow, you, me too. And all of a sudden there's a different system at play because people find collegiality and, and bravery connected to that one standout individual. I often call it like the Spartacus moment. <laughs> um, uh, but that takes somebody who has absolutely squared the morality of something and is just not prepared to compromise themselves to do that. And I think there are lots of things about compromise that we see in organisations and they become norms and then they become even more likely to be corrupted and we don't take a stand. We look at misogyny, we look at exclusive activities, we look at boardrooms that are just not 
not diverse at all and people kind of protecting their interests and you're like it's a natural instinct to survive but it's also a natural instinct to look after the people around you who you would call your tribe so i think we've lost some of that tribal maturity and perhaps even wisdom in favor of individuality and if it suits me i'm not going to change the system it's like hmm, I'm not sure that's the criteria that we should be looking at i'm aware that you know it's a very philosophical debate we're that we're having now but yeah the reason why i think it, it's really important to mention this within uh, you know the, the scope of talking about strategic hr is because yeah. in many ways who is who is to blame? Is HR to blame for something like this? Are they not custodians of culture? Should they be the ones that are the first to, let's say, not necessarily whistleblow, but at least raise a flag to the senior management and say, hey, yeah. what we're doing is not okay. It will lead us to a dark place. Do you think that they yeah. should be the ones taking this responsibility? Yeah, I think unequivocally, yes. And I think the why behind that is that there is an extension of the act of looking out for the people that extends, I think, to that guardianship and that sort of stewardship of morality and right and ethical. And that's not just to keep the company out of court in a tribunal sense for unfair dismissal. That is just because it's like if we compromise and we are harmful to our people, that is a non-recoverable position. And, and that's really damaging in all sorts of respects to the reason the company exists in the first place, right? Because if consumers see now that people are abusive towards their own employees, they will withdraw their purchasing because it's just not morally right to them. Some some won't, some just want cheap. But, but lots of people now are really interested in supply chains and ethics. And the company I love for this is Tony's Chocolate Only, the way they talk about slave-free chocolate, because I don't think there are people who realise there is still child labour and slavery involved in the cocoa industry. So that's the sort of thing I think where an HR um, guardianship role is absolutely vital to the point that it doesn't make itself like the, the point of firing by saying, CEO, no, you can't do that. Well, I'll we'll get rid of you and get somebody who will. But as a sort of advisory, which is, I'm telling you now, this is going to backfire and here's the damage that could be caused. So I'm going to hold that line and let you think about the course of action you want to take. Because if you want to take a course of action that's difficult, I'm with you. But if you want to do something that's harmful, I'm not. And I think that's a, just a very strong distinction you can make in HR. And that, uh, sadly, I don't see enough of it because I still see some you know, complicitness in there. And I think sometimes organisations deliberately demean HR to administrators so that it can get away with that and say, we pay the bills, you do what we tell you. So the companies that are more wise here have elevated HR to being very significant and influential because they need them as the conscious choice and with conscience not just the um deliverers of any diktat that comes from on high so if you do have to downsize then do it with dignity you know because hr will go yeah the numbers i get it they don't stack up we over recruited whatever however let's let's work out how we can be with people so that we can show our morality and our sense of duty to them even if we can't keep them forever that they can go on to something else yeah. So to be willing to compromise without being willing to get compromised. Yeah, I think I think that's exactly it. Don't get compromised. That's a great way to phrase it. Yeah. So you mentioned that HR should be elevated to a strategic role, should be taking responsibility for stewardship of the culture in company, in yeah. organizations and so on. Mm. Yeah. But if if they are not in this position yet. If you are yes. an HR person with ambition who is recruited mm. to an organization that is perhaps somewhat stale or traditional in a mm. non-flattering sense, what yeah. do you do? I think the ace in the pack uh, is that people are complex and that um, leaders uh, believe that there is a kind of predictability to what they decide upon and how it's executed and the results of that. I think we know that's not a straight line. There are lots of things we need to navigate about, like you say, culture, ethics, um, and there's something about people really feeling part of something not being done to that has a difference in the acceleration and the amplification of um, of success criteria but i think we need evidence to prove that 
So I think that's where we go. We go along the lines of how do we describe the impact that people have in both a performance sense and perhaps in a performance lag sense and what causes that? Because if we can point to business leaders and say, if you're too dominant, that will create a temporary lift in performance, but gradually it will dissipate. And here's the proof. So, so then the leaders go, oh, wow, I didn't realise that. It's like, yeah. So what do we do? Well, we include them. We make it much more open and transparent and we iterate and adapt based on their feedback. Oh, that's all I need to do? Yeah. So what does that look like then? And perhaps you can then set a trajectory on some research you might find about more inclusive companies. Or you at least commit the board to doing some experiments and regular test and learn on impact. So they go, oh, yeah, it's working. So my way of being is not detracting. No, it's enhancing. Oh, great. OK. And I think most leaders are so attuned to their impact of success that they want to see that continue. <laughs> um, so I think if you can align your expertise and advice with the success criteria that the business notices, then you can sort of act as this translator between hard edge business outcomes and people playing their part in delivering them without punishing them, without overdoing it and burning them all out. So if they're working really well and performance is really high, but you start to see wellness tripping down, you can red flag it and go, I think we're leaning in too hard. Let's look at the profits. Do we need to build some more resource? Do we need to get some more technology? Because this will go down more and it will suffer. So then we need to uptick and we need to look after people. Because I think that's a, a strong thing that the operational community aren't quite so tuned into, but HR will be. So it's a perfect coming together of machine and, and human. And I think that's going to increase more as technology comes in with AI and so on. So I think HR needs to be even more on the case with how we can leverage machines and people in a, in a really harmonious kind of way. So I think that's our, that's our key play, really. It's evidenced and it needs to be persuasive, but I think it's a way of not just creating a fluffy argument about people, but a very tactical and tangible business impact, because that will get leaders listening and compliant in the way we talked about with the behavioural science, so that they understand their role is not just needing a machine, but, but inspiring people. Let's look at some yeah. points of leverage here. So mm. how do we make this argument practical? You know, people are getting tired, they are mm. about to get mm. burned out. What kind mm. of what kind of argument are we building here? Uh, what is the what is the damage, and how to present yeah. it in such a way that uh, yeah. that the management will be open to yeah. such argument? I think we have to define different forms of value for a start, right? So I think we can show things like material value. So this is what our machinery gives us, and our processes give us. They're really efficient. They create value. And that all leads to the balance sheet. That's the financial value. But I think we have to get cleverer at showing human value, as, as an example. So, you know, how people come together and, and overachieve and, and look after each other and so on. And that can be done where you've seen people swarm to a problem, solve it, and how that human value manifested in that. But then I think there are two other forms of value that I think are really important, and we don't talk about them enough. One is social value, so the fact that we create the bonds that creates the strength that pushes things through. And there's a motor manufacturer over here in the UK, which at the moment is creating an enormous amount of social value, so people feel really connected to each other because they're about to pivot entirely to EVs. And all the engineers have got to relearn EV type engineering, not just petro diesel engineering, but they're all doing it together. So they've created social value in them doing it in academies and sharing and mastery and apprenticeships and so on. And the energy is palpable. So that's one. And then the other one is intellectual value. And that's like, what do we put as a value on our intellect and our capabilities that don't just sit in a key role, but they're leverageable and we've got people who play into that and who could play into that because that will justify things like continued investment in learning and so on. So I think if we've got a balance sheet that shows material value, social, intellectual and human, uh, that's a more sophisticated play on what the impact then is to financial. It's going to take some hard yards, but I think there are enough people around who are analysts and people who get the kind of impacts of psychologically positive environments who could populate that so there's quite a bit lying around and I think that's what I'd want 
my HR kind of director to be really strong on, which is how do I create a more balanced way of looking at value so that we've got the right kind of levers to pull at different points, you know, controversial decision to pivot to a new product like the motor manufacturer that has impact across all of those um, value streams. And they've approached it in a systematic, but very humanly way. And it's working. Oftentimes yeah. attribution of this to the bottom line is very difficult, if not completely yeah. impossible to manage. Yeah. Uh, and you also mentioned that a lot of the approaches that you wanted to mm. implement or started implementing were alternative as, at the time, mm. Uh, mm. Agile being a prime example. And yeah. I find that it's quite rare. The, the HR recognizes the value of being the alternative or just openly stating yeah. like we are shifting our values and we will mm. change our approaches to match our values. And yes, mm. it will make us different on the market. And that's good. Mm. Differentiation is is always yeah. good as long as yeah. you can leverage it in the right way. And it's yeah. a matter of communicating it to the world. Maybe you will have, let's say, less potential can candidates, but you will have more dedicated candidates. You know, exactly. you real ambassadors without having to pay for them. Uh, Patagonia is a great example of that. Uh, everybody who wears yeah. Patagonia is effectively exactly. selling Patagonia. But most of the time, this is because they really know the story behind the brand. And yeah. they are selling the story behind the brand and thereby selling the, the yeah. merchandise itself. So Great that's point. something that I hear very rarely in the HR circles. So yeah. I think that the, the one person that you maybe left out a little bit from the, yeah. the HR uh, alarm Friends. spectrum yeah, mm. it could be the marketing person. Because they oh, yeah. are truly the ones who can create the kind of oh, yeah. that sells. <laughs> Great point, actually. Yeah, I guess I I almost put the marketers in the design fraternity, right? Because they do use that approach. So you're absolutely right to call them out, and and you're absolutely right to create this connection between the sense of uh, attachment to the employer brand as being something that authentically is so powerful in terms of reputation, like you say, the higher, that kind of thing, because you do find that has economic positives in all sorts of ways. And you're right to point to things like not so many applicants, but the right applicants. Um, and, and something about people making such a preliminary choice that you're the place to come to, that's almost uh, unbreakable until you really, really violate their um, sense of what you're all about. And, and, and there lies the potential to create the psychological safety aspect um, that you talked about there, because I think when loyalty is that strong, the psychological safety would more naturally appear because any kind of chink in that armor or fracture in that um, kind of thing would 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 uh, would give people the sense like well I, this is not how we are here this is not what goes on here because they would they would be seen as protectors of that brand and that essence and that's where again an organism i think comes in incredibly powerfully because they would have such an emotive attachment to it they would manifest all the qualities that they were attracted to in the first place. So culture there almost feels like it's just a power source that others um, seek. So you're right, the marketer with the strongest sense of virtue and um, authenticity to that has a massive part to play because they, they don't have to spin or fake it. They can absolutely amplify what people are feeling and how they're being as a result of that. And it, it becomes like a culture code that, that becomes so known and, and, and tangible that people can spot those mini violations and go, well, that's not how it is here. And people go, oh, wow, did I just do that? Yeah, right. And it becomes a, a much more sort of um, egalitarian environment too, where positional power doesn't mean you don't get called out. Uh, and that's helpful in keeping check egos uh, and so on. So I think Otto Sharma in, in Theory U talks about an eco system, not an ego based system. And that's exactly what I think this would create. And Patagonia is a brilliant example of that. You've spent quite a bit of time in the, in the HR world. What did you see were the changes throughout your professional lifetime in the yeah. HR world? That's a brilliant question, a really, really good question, because I think um, 
the, the little story I'll tell you there is when I was working in IT projects, I wasn't always a very popular person to enter into a meeting room or environment because IT had a reputation for letting people down. It, it didn't deliver what it was supposed to do. And so I kind of took that on the chin and realised and, and there were lots of efforts to improve and I started to see that. So I thought, ah, you know, sometimes you go through cycles where this happens. So I move into HR. And then what did I find? I still wasn't popular in rooms because HR had kind of under delivered um, and I had a reputation for being bureaucratic and slow. And I was like, wow, uh, you know, is it me then? Do I follow failing corporate functions? Um, but I think it has moved on significantly in that time. And I think that's almost like a natural cycle of the understanding of people and its impact on brand, as we just said, and performance and the, the things you need to be more balanced in so that you don't have burnout, bullying and all that kind of thing. They've, they've risen up the kind of corporate agenda, I suppose you'd say, and they're much more included now in decision making and so on. So I think that's helped HR have more of a call to provide guidance on inclusion, to, go, to provide guidance on change programs and adaptation and emotional labor and all those kind of things so i think the business cycle has evolved to gift opportunities i think for hr to show its influence and its credibility and so on it hasn't always delivered um, and there are still too many organizations where people don't feel the sense that hr has got their back it's got the organization's interests purely at heart so i think it's still got work to do but i think it's the timing for HR to now realise its potential that, like we talked about, stewards, guardians of culture, etc., uh, demonstrators of value that's less tangible. I think these are some of the business areas that haven't been well um, resolved. And now is a chance for HR to be part of that resolution with the friends that we talked about. So I would say that its performance has been somewhat limited by itself and the realisation of what it could do. Now, what it could do, the realisation is higher and some are starting to get to that point of heightened impact. But it's new for quite a few people. It's demanding for quite a few practitioners. So I think it's still in its early stages of maturing into what it could be. But the signs are that it's a welcome thing for a lot of HR professionals who've been frustrated perhaps by their diminished sense of um, impact and accountability. It seems that we are approaching an economic downturn. To a degree, it seems like uh, companies may have had the luxury of uh, yeah. bestowing more uh, importance to HR and how people feel. But yeah. people point. tend to become numbers again when numbers are at play, where it's really mm. the bottom line. So did you perhaps, in your experience, see this happening throughout the 2009 crisis? Did you see the diminished uh, role of HR? Mm. I would say that 2008 felt different because I think we were starting to get the sense of what employee engagement and culture did. We had about 10 years under our belt of that, and we were just starting to realise how leverageable that was. So I still think some of those things were... Um, uh, a little bit less convincing and perhaps immature. And now I think there's been much more research tagged to things like mental health support and flexible working options. But I also think it's probably different that, that I'll counter your economic downturn with the fact that we're probably likely to see an explosion in things like generative AI, which could offset some of that because there could be some incredible breakthroughs in terms of efficiencies and so on that don't necessarily mean people are then um, less desired because of the fact that it can be automated. There are different things people will be needed for as a service enhancement, right? So I think what will happen is during this time of potential economic crunch that's a bit longer in its tail is the realisation of things like relational, empathetic humanly skills are absolutely optimal and so therefore that could be almost like a renaissance of of people during a time that normally it would have meant commoditization now i'm not just being wildly optimistic here i am talking to a lot of people who have really sort of sensed this and looked at their business lines going i can create such strong customer commitment through this 
with automation dealing with the things that we currently have people doing to free my people up to create absolute gold star service for them i'll win from other companies and you kind of think mm, i can see that um now that might mean there are still casualties in companies that fail because they don't take that advantage and therefore that might mean that those people don't have that work anymore but i think work is shifting to being much more uh emotional rather than purely transactional so that might mean the people side comes back with a kind of weird vengeance i'm seeing a lot of people talk about craft i'm seeing a lot of people talking about hyper personalization and hyper individuality in terms of what customers want and the only way we can do that is if tech takes the heavy lifting and we can do the customization and the real high touch support um so yeah my hope is that we we may not feel quite so flush with financial capital but i think where the capital will go is where we'll then see human capital being hugely advantageous and that might mean a nice upward trend to counter what would normally be a quite solemn slump um, i'm not denying it i'm just sensing that there's a there's a there's an uptick to this as well is there any way that uh, the hr managers can prepare for this shift what can they start doing today to be ready when this comes to uh, yeah. be able to show how their interests actually align yeah. with the interests of the rest of the management, especially CFOs? Yeah, well, I think it comes back to what I said, which is know the economics and know the potential for a, a slightly adapted version of economics that includes a much more holistic way of measuring capital. So I think that's one strong learning curve to be on. And I think the other one is to double down on the psychology, the emotional intelligence, the human factors, so that actually you can represent them in such a way which is an incredibly tangible connection to business efficiency, business optimization, customer loyalty, market share domination, uh, recruitment, swiftness, all these kind of things. Because I think if you can very confidently talk to those, I think what will happen is that the rest of the business world will go, oh, wow, we, we, we're not as capable there. We know the machine, we know the market or whatever, but we don't know that stuff. That's a really nice plug-in. So they'll start to want to work more in a kind of harmonious cycle of, of exploration and, and delivery of that. So I think that could create a different kind of demand for HR. They'll be much more at the forefront of the thinking. Um, so therefore, they'll have to get more pioneering, entrepreneurial maybe. Um, and by virtue of that, I think they'll have to leverage things like exponential thinking much quicker than they would normally have had to because the the chances are those growth curves will be pretty big and quick. And that means you've got to then have all the back infrastructure sorted to support that. So therefore, you can't say, no, it's going to take us six weeks to recruit people. They're like, no, we need a contingent workforce then that can be mobilized within six minutes. And, you know, it's that kind of demand. So I think HR has got to get used to that pace and intensity, perhaps. So all of those things, I would say, are teachable because there are different parts of the business community that have done those things before. And it will be just a more perhaps a dominant version of that. Um, and other stuff will be super contextual. So they'll have to kind of work it into their own organization climate psyche culture and so on so they can hold those things true so uh, i expect them to have to be more pioneering um uh, more quickly i guess is what i'd sum that up as is there any any specific trend that you also see for the shift in organizations a lot more flexible workplace coming up in yeah this situation yeah, that, that story hasn't uh, unfurled, even though lots of people say, oh, look, five days a week is popular again. It's like, well, it isn't everywhere. And, and you know, Nick Bloom's research at Stanford proves it's kind of plateaued now. Hybrid has got a very nice kind of place in the middle of uh, turning up and um, uh, being fully remote. So I think the days of people going, oh, it's all going to be remote. I think everybody thought that was like unlikely. But I think that's established the rhythm now. But I think what we're starting to see is people wanting to be much more sincere and perhaps deliberate about what in-office means, what hybrid means and what remote means from a more psychodynamic point. Again, it's like if we're coming together, we don't want to be sat on calls. We want to do creative things, bonding things, complex things. So I think we're starting to try and pivot work to be done in the place that it's best to be done. 
which is a nice way of being able to sort of present back to people a degree of certainty. We still don't quite have that control yet, but I've seen more people get to that point where they know why people are together, why they can work in a kind of rhythmic hybrid um, versus remote. So I think that one will resolve itself over the next two to three years to the point that we're thinking, why did we have so much debate and confusion over it? Because look, it's here now. It's like, but we had to do that messy bit in the middle. That's what it feels like, messy middle. Um, I think some of the other trends are linked to, again, higher kind of plain stuff. So I would say that the attachment to a purposeful organisation with purposeful work, whatever level that is, I think is much more um, a thing people are looking for. They're like, if I'm going to turn up wherever I turn up, if I'm going to be doing stuff for a long time, I, I need to kind of know the point of it and, and that it does something that I can be proud of. So I think that's come in to be much more a choice based thing. And if companies can only attach to stacking up cash, that will only go so far. It's got to be. But but to what end? What's the point of what we're doing here? So um, there's a company over here. They grow uh, sugar, but their lead on their recruitment is not that at all because sugar's got a bad reputation, diabetes and obesity. So they talk about that as a necessary product in the food systems of ours, but what do they do with the waste? What do they do with generating power to 250,000 homes and animal food that, that they provide with the offshoots and all this? And it's kind of like, wow, I didn't know any of that. So I think people are going to lead more with purposeful things that they do, and then that links to the climate. So I think those two things, purpose and climate, they're the they're not even trends, they're just necessities that we need to address. But we need to tabulate work to those two things more for people to really get a sense of their contribution to something worthwhile and something that's got planetary good attached to it. I imagine that a lot of HR people are still either preparing the plans for next year or considering what to do, what to include. Could you help me? set up a checklist of things that they really shouldn't miss on to really be prepared for yeah. this year. Well, well, AI's got to be top of that list, right? Because if you are not even contemplating the impact of generative AI, particularly on the work that you do, whatever that is, and the work that HR does, then forget it, game's off. Because I think the next 18 months are going to be incredibly transformative with that as a vehicle to deliver services, to enhance our understanding, to take some of the heavy load off and, and all that kind of thing. And, and that links to my second point, which is if you're not tabling capacity as an issue for you to address in an HR team, you're in trouble because I think we're over capacity now with the kind of demands of what's going on. So with more coming in, we'll be even more overdrawn on capacity and you're just going to capitulate your function. So we've got to work out how do we create enough space, time, thought, application to do the things that add the most value, to make the most change, to future proof our function and this business that's got to come in because if you don't do that no matter how noble your plans or how brilliant your strategy is if you haven't got the capacity forget it you know and so capacity and generative ai are very closely linked because one will lead to the other but you've got to create capacity to do that in the first place so that's my my call to start with and that feels very tactical but i think i'm just being super realistic about the demands right because I think once you get those two things in, in at least clear and distinct and measured ways and start to release some capacity, you can then start to go into, right, what are the capabilities we need, not just now, but in the next three, five, ten years, because it's not just generative AI. There will be that potential relational burst of humanly skills and advance in psychology and whatever it might be so it's almost like let's get those in mind and work towards those because if we don't now catching up is going to be even more difficult down the line we need to bring those skills nearer and start to mature them sooner to give us a competitive advantage in the complexity of the world so some of that might be about green economies um, as an example so yeah so work out the capabilities next so so far i haven't even said you know work out some kind of noble vision and strategy because i think those three things have got to be put into some semblance of agreement and order whatever your destination <laughs> right so then start thinking okay now if we've got all these things what do we want to set out 
as our noble vision to enable those things to really, really do the, the value add things. And then from that comes all sorts of other usual things about, you know, revamp your talent proposition, look at contingent work, tap into demographics you don't now for more inclusivity and so on. And so I think that's my urge next year is generative AI, top of the tree, closely linked to capability, uh, capacity. So those two things come in and then capability and then everything else follows. That's my recommended game plan. Tell me, how do you use AI at this point? Okay in a limited way, but I'm emerging into it a bit more. So I'll give you an example. So I was um, about to teach some organization design and I wanted a fictitious company scenario that I thought would be really good to stretch the people coming to this to think, oh, how do I create the organization design for that? So I fed it lots of parameters and I prompted it to say, can you create this company and can you create various things, even um, uh, 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 a year's accounts. You know, I, I gave it rough parameters. I said, can you create me a set of accounts? <laughs> and it just did the lot. <laughs> it took about what? It took an hour with me prompting it and it coming back with things and me just kind of tidying it up. I think it would have taken me a couple of days to research and compile and stress test and so on with lots of manual um, uh, cognitive labor. So that as an example, I thought to myself, wow, I just gained myself <laughs> about 12 14, 16 hours, um, and, and, and yeah, and just small pieces where people um, are asking for a little bit of a sort of narrative on something. I'm kind of saying, can you write this in this style and use it in this way? And so it helps me with a little bit of compilation. I, I crunched a lot of employee sentiment data in it from a survey that was all the free text comments. And I said, can you, here's the context of the company. Um, they were asked questions like this. Can you give me some categorized themes that have come from all these various statements? My goodness me, it came back with a really quite rich and thorough playback, which again would have taken me the best part of half a day, if not longer. So I'm creating a few shortcuts for me. That's how I'm using it. Yeah. And, and, and I want to do more with it. But at the minute, I'm still in the throes of working out how I can make it do good things for me. For me, one of the most interesting exercises I've done lately is to create a couple of advisory boards. You know, Ooh, nice. it's really interesting to just build a fictional table of, wow. let's say, historical characters that you'd really admire, <sighs> and you know, you'd like them to wage in on your decisions. Like my personal board consists of Marcus Aurelius and Nietzsche and Seneca and so on. And so every time I have a tough decision to make, I write the outline of what's going on and you know i ask them what do you guys think what would you do in my shoes and it's really what a genius this one this one can be really valuable for hr as well and in some way you can role play with them like you can create these characters of a ceo who thinks in a certain way and a cfo who thinks a certain way and you can yeah. teach them your ideas and get their inputs before you go to pitch the actual person so wow. i find this one to be a really valuable Brilliant. That's brilliant. I mean, I think that's what we're doing, aren't we? We are we are literally like babies learning how to talk with this. And it itself is quite, you know, infant like uh, because it needs us to help it uh, shape what it's already got in there in some semblance of order. I do find it interesting that it still has what somebody called hallucinations and it can report back on things that are completely inaccurate. But it is almost like, well, that's kind of good, really, because we don't over rely on it. Do you know what I mean? There's... Mm -hmm. There's a lecturer I know who's written a book actually called I um, Human, Thomas Chamorro Premisic, and he's um, getting his students to do their like submissions uh, using ChatGPT. But he says, but before you submit it, I want you to validate what it says and spot errors. And so they're learning a new skill, which is use it, but don't just trust it. And I think that's genius because I think that's what we all need to do yeah. is know how to use it, but know how to be trusted in using what it comes back with. Um, so I think that is a, a, a capability that like a million percent, we need to get there really, really quickly. So I think my intent um, next year is to absolutely do a bit more of what you're doing, which is how can I deploy it and what can it do for me? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's best to treat it as a bunch of very talented interns. That's yeah. like use a combination of them. Like, you know, you, you have the yeah. GP, but then oh, you wow. have Bard and others. 
and maybe yeah. you know, try to test similar prompt on all of them to have them fact check each other in a sense. I had a lovely flashback then to me as a work experience person in the building society doing additional voluntary contribution checks from a massive folder full of printouts. I'm like, that's what ChatGPT is. It's exactly. me, full of enthusiasm, maybe got the information, doesn't know what to do. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but it is it is very uh, very creative and very useful. Uh, like I challenge my whole team at some point to try and wow. use it for every task that they can. Of course, with some limitation of not sharing the yeah. personal data or yeah. data of our clients. Yeah. But uh, outside of that, we came up with a lot of these cool use cases, uh, and oh. really does release a lot of. Uh, work. Oh, I like it. I like it. Um, yeah, I, I do think there's something about. Um, when I look at some of the technologies that people use in the workplace now anyway, it's almost like, wow, you are still pretty much doing what you did in 1998, Outlook and that kind of thing. It's like there are so many different things you could be doing. So I do worry that there are some people who've got such a steep learning curve for the new generation of technology that's going to come in with the embedded AI kind of stuff. I do sort of hope, though, that there is a way that AI makes it easier for those people to accelerate to that point because they've probably... Um, not acquired the kind of built capability that we've got, perhaps. Um, uh, and so it will be such a steep curve for them. I hope AI smooths that particular curve out. But we do all need to get much more digitally capable. We absolutely do. Um, and this could be a way for us to do that in a very quick and very equalizing way so that we can take full advantage of it. Because I think digital has been somewhat misfiring and, dare I say it, misused because we haven't had that level of capability uh, that we need to. And this could get us to a point where the machines have ironically brought us to a level where we can not compete with the machine, but we know what the machine's capable of and we can program it a little bit more, maybe not literally. But I think, you know, Copilot, Microsoft launching that, um, and things like the whole digital concierge thing, I think that's going to create an enormous amount of capacity for us to do much more thoughtful and less um, repetitive things, definitely. Okay, so what would be your recommendation to somebody who is starting out their career, like you were you know, 20 Ooh. years ago? Uh, what advice would you give to yourself? Oh, what a lovely question. Uh, so I think if we go back to what we said earlier on in this about doubling down on things like understanding human behaviours, I think there's an even more strong call for that because I think we have got to get used to a 2D world, an avatar world, um, where less of the uh, sensing can come through, right? And we have to rely more on dialogue and, and, and so on. So I think there's something about... I'd want to double down on what that looks like in the sort of next part of the 21st century, because I think it will be much more needed to interpret and understand rhythms and moods and all that kind of thing. So I think there's something about that, almost like a, a digitally um, aware way of understanding the psychology of decisions and choice and behaviours and so on and so forth. Um, I also think that you would be wise to think more like a futurist or a scenario modeler, because I think what we are trying to do, and I think technology and AI particularly will help us do that, is shorten the learning curve on how we prevent disasters, how we avoid catastrophes, how we can create certainty by using scenarios to, to, to play things out so that we've got much more informed choices earlier in the cycle than if we had to let them play out. And I hope that makes sense because I think uh, I'm, I'm sort of anticipating potential digital worlds that would have so many variables and permutations that you could play out a scenario and go, right, fast forward me three years, what's my business doing with all these parameters in it? Boof. And, and it takes into account world, macro, climate, whatever, and it comes back and says, you will be more successful by 50%. And then you do another one, and it says, you will be less successful, you will lose 5% of your market, and da, da, da. people go, wow. So then it gives them a chance to calibrate decisions at a much more informed point through scenarios. So 
if we haven't got the technology that supports that entirely now, we can do that with our imagination. And I think we ought to get better at scenario modeling because that's the only way we're going to kind of bend the arc of the future a little bit nearer to us and be more sure about our preparation for potential instances and events that could throw us off course or accelerate what we do. Um, which I think is what futurists have probably been trying to do for decades. <laughs> so I think we need to get better at that. Um, and then I guess the other one is probably linked to the environment and understanding more about ecological disaster and recovery and repair. And so some of the bioscience stuff I'm seeing now is unbelievably advancing and, and not just, you know, decarbonizing, but absolutely starting to think about regenerative things. I think there's a huge work market coming in planetary repair. So if we get better at knowing what that is, we can be better positioned for companies which will not extract anymore. They'll earn money by repairing. That's my hope anyway. Thank you for listening to the Code and Culture podcast. This episode concludes the first season of my conversations with HR experts focused on the strategic role of HR in building future-proof organizations where employees experience growth, connectedness, and purpose. Stay tuned for a bonus episode where we will tie the loose ends and bring the lessons learned into one coherent summary of our findings. And don't miss the next season of the Code & Culture podcast, focused on building culture of innovation. If you enjoy the Code & Culture podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast platform and help us spread the word. Thank you.